Hey guys, welcome back to the second week of virtual Sunday school while we're in the middle of this coronavirus issue and uh, we're all having to be hunkered down and have social distancing and, and all those kind of things. Uh, I would love to meet with you. I would love to be able to catch up to you, hang out with you, um, pat you on the back, give you a hug. But right now that's all what we're not supposed to do. And so we're doing this virtual Sunday school. Uh, this is only part A. I want to encourage you to do part A and part B of this. In the way of announcements, i uh, got a few things to go over, over with you. First, the eight out. We decided to move the start date back to after Easter based on the last govern or the governor's uh, announcement this past week. Uh, just felt like we don't want to rush trying to get everybody together and physically together at this stage. Uh, and so we decided to we back that off till after Easter for that, but be watching out for that. I still want to see that become a reality where we can hang out together. Uh, don't forget the Crisis Connection page on our website. All the links for everything is always going to be there. And I want to encourage you to use that if you don't get an email or a text. There's the place to find it. You can also use the Church Alexio calendar to be able to get the stuff. Uh, all the links will be on a calendar issue under details. You'll be able to get to a link to any of the Zoom meetings or virtual meetings that will be happening. We also have our small group Sunday school. That is part B of this lesson. Those are now going to be at 7.30 p.m. on Sunday night. Uh, there will be a middle school guys, a middle school girls, and then the high school are all meeting together this week uh, and probably weeks to come unless the group gets too large. And so we want to encourage you to, to be a part of the virtual Sunday school. Uh, that will be the discussion aspect of the lesson, so please come and be a part of that. And then we still have our Zoom fellowship meetings Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 o'clock. This past uh, Thursday, uh, we, we played a scavenger hunt game as well as some Would You Rather. Uh, and Tuesday, we played some Would You Rather. It's a time of just hanging out for a little bit, asking a few questions, playing a virtual game if we can figure out one and find one. And uh, a sh very short devotional is kind of what we do during that time. So that's kind of what's happening in the youth group in that way. Hi, welcome back. I hope you're having a good week. We have another contest going on. It'll be for a drawing for three different Subway gift cards. Whoa. Hey, all you got to do to get into this contest is text a given code that'll be in the Sunday School lesson part of the way through. Text it to Rick at my cell phone number, which will be on the screen, with your name for a chance to win. We're going to have the drawing, though, this time. We're gonna, it'll be a drawing. We're going to do that on Tuesday at the 4 o'clock Zoom meeting. And another chance to win. This will be during your Sunday school groups, your small groups on Sunday evening at 7.30. Your group leader will be giving you a code to text and text that to Rick with your name. So you got two chances to win because you'll get your name in the hat twice for three Subway gift cards. So remember, watch, text, play. Drawing will be Tuesday at 4 o'clock in the Zoom fellowship meeting. Hey, thanks for watching and we'll see you Sunday or Tuesday. Take care. This week, we want to look then at our Sunday school lesson is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 20, 23, and it's disciples engage with their surroundings. We're in a series talking about what a disciple is, and one of the things that a disciple does is engage with their surroundings. And so we're going to be looking at that today and looking at some scripture for that. If you see behind me is, is that's a Where's Waldo picture. It says, what do you see? And you know, in the Where, Where's Waldo picture is all colors and you're trying to find where is Waldo in that. Learning to be attuned with your surroundings for the cause of Christ. So that's the es essence of what we want to do today. To start us off, I've got a video. It's an old, 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 old video, FBI training video on what to do in a bank robbery. <clears throat> and so we're going to watch this. I encourage you to, to, as you watch this, to try to figure out and make sure you see everything that you need to see. Uh, the idea of this came because when I was in an inductive Bible class in college, one of the things we had to do was watch one of these and write down how many things we saw. So I want you to watch this video, and then we'll get back at, right after that and, and talk through it a little bit. The big advantage the robber has over a teller is shock, surprise, and fear. The fear is usually the fear of the unknown. So we can show you here a teller's eye view of some typical robberies. As you watch, take advantage of them and train yourself to meet a hold-up emergency at your window. Lunchtime is one of the most popular hold-up hours. Some of the employees are out of the building. At the moment, you have two customers. One leaves, 
And now you have a robber at your window. This is a stick-up. Fill up the sack with all your money. Trip your alarm button right now. Begin to get the money, then look him over. This is a typical disguise, and unfortunately a good one. A hat conceals his head and hair. Dark glasses cover most of his features, and gloves leave no fingerprints. After he leaves, he can remove his disguise in an everyday manner without attracting attention. Height and build. Five, six and a half, medium build. Look under his hat for hair coloring. What you can see of it is sandy gray. Sandy gray hair. He's about 55 years old. You can see his mouth and nose because they are not covered. What else can you spot? The gloves are brand new. Maybe bought just for this holdup. He's leaving now. Take a look at him from a distance so you can identify him in a lineup later. Okay, as you watch the video, what are some things that you saw? Let me ask you some questions about the video, some things to consider. Was the robber wearing glasses, sunglasses, or no glasses? He had glasses on. Did he have a mustache? There was no mustache. Uh, were his earlobes connected or not? They were not connected. And what did he have for lunch? Well, I have no idea. Neither would you based on the video we just watched. But finding little things as you look deep. And, and, and this is kind of to help us to, to think about this. How we notice and engage in the real world is an important part of our walk with Christ. <clears throat> in other words, as we're trying to walk with Christ and, and look for opportunities to share Christ, we don't want to do it with no view of what's happening around us. We want to make sure that what we do is, in, is engaged within what is happening. I mean, right now, the church is having to change into this virtual kind of approach to continue to try to figure out how do we share the love of Christ in a situation like we're in now, where we're in what I've termed a virtual church. <clears throat> Through engaging with your surroundings, you can ultimately lead people to Christ. In other words, when you're focused in on your surroundings, you're allowing them to be a part of what's happening, you have an opportunity to lead people to Christ. To not do that, sometimes you can hurt the cause of Christ. <clears throat> Here's a good example. I was at Sam's uh, uh, like a week, week ago on Friday, I guess it was, when everybody's still freaking out. And so I'm there Friday morning. I, I get my buggy to get a few things, and in the process, the, I look, and the front of the store is packed with people in line. Now, I'm using the, the Scan and Go app from Sam, so I don't have to stand in line, which was the only reason I still bought stuff at Sam's, or else I would have turned around and walked out, but it's slammed. But let's say I didn't have the Scan, scan and Go. Let's say that I had to go through the line. <clears throat> and so I go through the line, and so when I get to the cashier after standing in this long line, there's still a long line behind me, of people waiting and every register looks like this. So I get there and so I make this decision, I'm gonna share Jesus with this lady. Is that the right time? See, I don't think so. That'd be the totally wrong time. Am I gonna help the cause of Christ sharing Jesus with her right there with all the lines backed up, with all the people backed up? Probably not. She's not gonna be very receptive because she's in the middle of, of being a cashier with a huge busy store. And so she does, she's not going to want to listen because she has a job to do right then. The people behind me are not going to like Christ either because <clears throat> I've now just held them up as I try to share Jesus with her. Now, if I want to give her a blessing, I want to be nice to her as I go through the line. That's a different story, okay? That's a different thing. But as far as the concept of me sharing the gospel, it would not be the right time. In 1 Corinthians 9, it says this. If you want to look with me here in your Bible or on the screen, it says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. <clears throat> to those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as, so as to win those not having the law. Verse 22, 
To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. So this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church about his approach to sharing the gospel with people. Let's go back and break this down now verse by verse or a couple verses at a time. And, and Jenna's going to now read for us uh, 1 Corinthians 9.19. Jenna. 1 Corinthians 9.19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Thanks, Jenna. As you notice, we, we were using a Snapchat filter uh, there, and we're going to do that through the scriptures just kind of as a fun thing that I asked some teenagers to read, and they came up with this concept of what, what if we use a Snapchat filter? So hopefully it'll, it'll help break the monotony a little bit. So here Paul, as he talks about <clears throat> the fact that he is free, and it, nobody owns him, he still takes and makes a choice to become a slave. Paul's choice is to become a servant so that he can look for opportunities to share Jesus. There's a foundational principle in this scripture, and that's this. We are called to be a servant. We are called to be a servant. See, this is not for ourselves or to be praised by anybody. We're not being a servant so people recognize us. We're being a servant because we're just going to serve Jesus. We're going to serve what his purpose. We're going to serve what God would have for us. We want to be a servant. And why would we want to be this according to the verse? To reach more people for Jesus. The more that we have an attitude of having a servant's heart to Christ and what he has for us and serving others in that process, the more opportunities we're going to have to share Jesus with other people. As we continue on in this passage, uh, we move into 1 Corinthians 9, 20, and 21, and McKenna's going to read this for us. So let's listen to what McKenna has to say as she reads the scripture. 1 Corinthians 9, 20 to 21. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. So as we see here, as McKenna has just read, and once again in a uh, Snapchat filter, uh, Paul breaks down these, this concept of what he's trying to be, uh, to, to win other people, trying to relate to them, connect to them. Um, and so Paul has this desire to win as many people as he can, and he knows that at times he needs to, I don't want to say not, he's not, not being real, it's not that he's not being his self, but he understands how to relate to different people in different ways. Our culture has some different aspects of culture, and in, in, in those, if you're going to share Jesus, at times you need to understand those cultures to share uh, Jesus. I wrote down these things in the slides. So Paul used culture and customs as an avenue to share the gospel. He, he took things that were common in the culture that did not violate his Christian principles and used those. That second point, Paul did not compromise his witness for the sake of those customs and cultures. So, no, he didn't sell out, but there's ways to be able to, to, to show Christ and within a cultural context. And Paul sets his preferences aside for the sake of the gospel. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So let me kind of break this down. There are, I wrote down some groups. And, and depending on which group, you've got to talk to those groups somewhat differently. And, and these are the three groups that's kind of in your world uh, that's out there. And there's other groups, and I know there's other groups. But I just throw, wrote these down. Sports, nerds, and geeks. All those guys think totally differently. Now, it's not that you can't be a sports person who's also a nerd because that can happen or, or a geek that's a nerd or a geek that's a sports person. I understand that that can happen at times. But the but bottom line, the, those groups have some different aspects and mentalities. And, and so in that world, how do you relate to them? And basically, based on who you are, finding those groups that you relate to better and that you can represent Christ to. I've shared with you guys before about the guy Philip in Kentucky that taught me how to work on computers, taught, taught me what was inside of them, how to open them up. He was a teenager. And as, he, as I worked with him, as I loved on him, as I looked to point him to Christ and, and just kind of befriend him, one day I get a phone call and he says, Hey, Rick, 
man, I've been, I've been listening and stuff, and I've been growing closer to God, but he said, I came to a place, I, I don't know Jesus. And, and could I talk to you? So he comes over to my house. We actually went out to my garage where all the computers were, and out there he prayed to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He's now actively involved in the church where he's at, same church I was at there in Kentucky. He still goes all the time um, and, and is actively involved. He worked with the teenagers for a while and helped out with them. And so that, that's one of those options of culture. I had a, 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 youth, a youth, he's a youth minister now. He was a youth in my youth group. Actually, he was an intern at the time. Uh, working while he was going to college, and, and Michael used video games. And because of the headsets and because many of the video games, you can talk to the people that are playing the games, he actually would play some of the virtual games with some of the students in the youth group and in the process work to disciple them, talking to them about the Lord while they played. And so Michael was using video games in, in that process. Uh, I, when, when this virtual church happened, you know, I was doing some reading and looking, and somebody, somebody started a church in Minecraft. And I thought, that's so cool to start, you know, start a church in, in this virtual world. Let's start a church and preach uh, with, within that virtual world. I just thought it was a, a really neat thing. But that last point there in the slide that we looked at says, Paul sets his preferences aside for the sake of the gospel. And, and what he's saying here is this. There are some things that I may personally like. I may even personally want to live up to, but can I, can, the, can I lay those aside and still honor Christ, honor God, and still use the, the, that thing of laying it aside to still share Jesus? One term that you might use would be something like a soapbox. You know, that soapbox, that thing that you're on that you always got to yell at people about or whatever. Can I lay that aside? for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, for the opportunity to share the gospel. But it, you can think of some preferences that some people may have that if you don't do this, one of those I, I think would be like, like I grew up to wear caps, ball caps really probably shouldn't be worn into church by any means. In a building, it's okay. Other people grew up where you shouldn't wear a ball cap in a building ever. You should always take off your ball cap. And definitely in church, you know, take off your ball cap, you know, I don't really care now, but for some people, could you lay that aside? Because there's really nowhere in scripture it says never wear a ball cap inside of a church. I've heard of some people, we had a, had a band come in and, and one, like the bass player played barefoot. And some people in the church were offended because they were playing up on the stage and he was barefoot. Uh, and, and I don't know if he did it because he was wanted to be comfortable or what he did it because, you know, well, I want to honor the Lord and this is holy ground. So I'm going to take off my shoes where I'm standing before the Lord. So I don't know his reason behind it, but there were some people who were actually offended at that. It's those kind of extra preferences where when it says Paul set aside his preferences for the sake of the gospel, be careful of what baggage you carry. Don't ever, don't ever dishonor the Lord in your actions, but be careful of some of this extra baggage that you might be able to share Christ a little better with. Then in 1 Corinthians 9.22, Lane's going to read. 1 Corinthians 9.22 To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. So here in 9.22, Paul lays out this, this aspect of, of figuring out how to change enough, once again, where it doesn't affect really your who you are actual person, but change enough that you can have an opportunity to lead some to the Lord. And so we need to figure out how can we change enough and connection points with people and loving on people that we can, we can have an opportunity to earn a right to be heard and then possibly share the gospel with them. <clears throat> and then he says this word, that I might save some. Now when he says that, I might save some, is Paul trying to tell us, hey, look, I, I'm trying to you know, win people to, to myself. I'm going to, I'm going to save them. And we know that, no, you can't. He can't save them. He's not going to be able to save them. Uh, and so I was thinking, okay, what's a good illustration that might be able to help us to better understand that term, that I might save some? And I was thinking that my mind went to Steve Harvey uh, and, and it went to Publisher Clearinghouse. Watch this clip. Publisher Clearinghouse prize results. Oh, my God! $40,000. <laughs> Chris 
How can you use the money? And I use the money? It happened by one, which means you can too. You know, thank you, Publisher Clearinghouse. I don't know what else to say. Got the check in her hand. You don't want to check in your hand? What you waiting on? PCH.com. Quick play. <laughs> As we watch these clips, it's not their money they're giving it away, but yet they're kind of getting the benefit of giving away uh, that money. Which brings us to this, we don't save people. <clears throat> it's not our deal. We're not the ones who save. We're not the ones who died on the cross. Jesus saves people, but he allows us to be a part of the process. He's the one who paid the price, but we can share this gift with others. And so we have an opportunity for a gift that's already been purchased with Jesus' blood to share that and to give that out to other people, which is like an awesome, awesome thing we get to do. And, and for some of us, we need to think in those terms of this is a gift from Jesus. How can I give this to some other people? Mallory is going to finish up the scripture with 1 Corinthians 9.23. So listen to Mallory as she reads. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 23. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. And so Mallory, thanks for reading that. I, it, that concept that we do all this for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do all this for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, as we look at how we live, as we look at who we are, as we look at how we mix and, and mingle with others, the underlying of that is for the gospel, for Jesus Christ to be able to be the witness that we need to be, to be the ambassador that we need to be. And so when we think in those things, the best question to ask is this, am I all in for Christ? Am I all in for Christ? As we're going through this, this coronavirus, as, as things are being up, upended and twisted, and guys, let me ask you this, are you all in for Jesus Christ? Are you allowing this to process in your mind to be all you can be for Jesus? Are you just kind of going through the motions and, and the such? Is God trying to give us a wake-up call to this nation uh, or to the world in this process? Uh, and I would just challenge you, you can't control anybody else. You can't control your mom. You can't control your dad. Uh, you, you, know, you can't control your little sister or your little brother that may be driving you nuts. Uh, or maybe you are the little brother or little sister driving your older brother and sister nuts. But this is what I know. You can't control you. You can lay your life before Christ in such a way that you say, I want, I want to be changed, and I want to be all in for Christ. And I would just encourage you with that. Let's pray. God, I just ask that you would help us <clears throat> to all be looking at ourselves in such a way that, w that we're all in, that we decide to be all in for you, uh, Lord. So just guide us and lead us in that. Help us to really examine that, uh, to be honest with ourselves in that, and uh Lord, in the changes that we need to make so that we're all in for you, help us to do that, Lord. Help us to, to, to live for you day in, day out, to have eyes that look around for circumstances in such a way that we can be used by you. Now guide us and lead us and allow the discussion within our small groups to be a good, a good time uh, as, we, as we meet in our small groups sometime in the next 24 hours to 48 hours. And so we lift all this to you, Lord. We ask that you would continue to be with the doctors and all the workers, the police officers, and all the emergency help, the people in the stores on the front lines uh, of this virus, Lord, to help protect them uh, and continue to help us to walk with you even during this time. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Guys, right before I go, I just want to encourage you to go with your small group. Uh, make sure you log in and you register there and, and get with them. Uh, this week and part of this lesson is to be discussed and interacted with with your small group. Okay, take care. I miss you guys